Alexander the Great, the shining light of ancient Greece. The prince from remote Macedonia would become the greatest conqueror of all time. No one would have thought that someone would try to conquer the whole world and that he would almost succeed. He was the first European to establish an empire that stretched from the Mediterranean to the end of the known world. Fame on the battlefield was dearer to him than his own life. He turned his war into a holy mission. He entered the stage as a liberator, and he dreamed of an empire where the peoples lived together in peace, with him being at the top. Only very few people had as much influence on history as Alexander the Great. Alexander's story starts with a legend. It is said that the gods announced his birth with natural phenomena. It must have been the night of July 20th, 356 BC, when Olympias went into labor. The royal family was hoping for a son. They needed an heir to the throne. Alexander was only the second born, but it was clear from the start that Olympia's son was destined to lead Macedonia into a bright future. Alexander, live up to your purpose. In the fourth century BC, Greece was undergoing radical change. While some still believed in myth and divine providence, Others were already seeking scientific reasoning. The big cities facilitated these new trends. Above all, Athens, which had established democracy. There, the citizens determined the politics. Alexander's home was far away from the modern centers, north of Mount Olympus, in a rural area. Macedonia had long been a simple peasant state, a kingdom that had long been economically irrelevant and politically in dire straits. Only Alexander's father, King Philip II, showed what he and his country were capable of. He reorganized his forces, developed new weapons, and turned the cavalry into his strongest attack formation. He extended his sphere of power in several battles, and he forged alliances. However, the four biggest cities turned against the victorious leader. They claimed that Macedonia was barbarian, although the kingdom did everything to modernize itself according to Greek standards. Philip promoted progress, especially in the Macedonian capital, Pella. The king turned the humble settlement into a stately seat of government. This was where Alexander grew up, in a time of great upheaval. The heir to the throne enjoyed an elite education. On a daily basis, he practiced close combat and the handling of weapons. His education prepared him for a tough reality. Whoever wanted to rule had to be able to fight. His father, Philip, lived by it. He was mostly at war, while Olympias took care of their son's upbringing. Come on, Alexander! Earn your companion's respect! Even defend yourself. Come here. 
Leave me alone. What's going on, son? I'm sorry, father. I... I have... Never show your weakness. You have to be the best, always. Stop it. He's still a child. That's not your business. Macedonia needs warriors. And what do I get? My first son is a moron, and the second one a loser. You ridicule me. Alexander, show him what you have learned. I've seen enough for today. Bastos. To understand the relationship between Philip and Alexander, it is important to take into account that although Philip was married to seven women, he only had two sons from these marriages. And his second son, Philip Aridaeus, didn't live up to his expectations. He might have had a physical impairment. Sometimes he's even characterized as moronic. Hence, Alexander was the only son that Philip could present to the world. Alexander not only had to live up to his father, but also to his divine descent. A mosaic from Pella shows him with a lion. He looks like Heracles, a son of Zeus. The lion symbolizes Alexander's royal descent, and Heracles symbolizes his godlike status. He was born into it. Alexander's parents also believed in their divine descent. This form of fictional pedigree wasn't uncommon in ancient times. Many royal families justified their claim to power with it. The belief in gods was taken seriously in Macedonia. No one doubted that the heir to the throne, Alexander, had inherent superhuman skills. But it was Olympia's religious beliefs that influenced Alexander. She engaged in religious rituals and kept telling the boy that he wasn't of this world. Come to me, my darling. Don't listen to your father. His heart is made of stone. I do as he wishes. Why is he always disappointed in me? Come on. No. He's not disappointed, he's jealous. Because your blood is more royal than his. Mother, please, you don't really believe that. I'll tell you a secret. The night you were conceived, I heard thunder. And I felt that lightning struck my body. But you're unharmed. Don't you understand? Zeus made you. Zeus is your father. Philip knows it and is jealous. That Zeus was Alexander's father is another spectacular story. These stories are usually told when it comes to the circumstances of conception of famous people from ancient times. Their mothers suddenly have spectacular dreams. Gods appear in the form of animals and father these children in a dream or in reality, who then have an inherent heroic aura. The heroes of Greek mythology were Alexander's role models. Like them, he wanted to be the best and exceed them all. His biggest hero was Achilles from the myth about the Battle of Troy. Achilles is the main figure. He is invulnerable and the bravest warrior. 
Patroclus, his loyal friend, fights by his side. Both die in combat, but their deeds make them immortal. Aristotle, one of Greece's biggest thinkers, has a transcript of the story made for Alexander. The king's son was only 13 when Aristotle agreed to educate the prince in Pella. He taught Alexander everything about Greek culture, drama, geography, sciences, as well as literature and philosophy. But most importantly, he studied Homer's Iliad. The story was compulsory reading. Every Greek knew it. Can you remember what Achilles' father told his son? He should always be the best and outdo everyone. My father could have said this. Your father might be wiser than many think. Did Achilles manage? Achilles' ambition is unlike normal people's ambition. He was driven by holy wrath. Because he took revenge for Patroclus and had his murderer dragged through the mud for days? That's right. But he also showed benevolence in having him buried in dignity. Achilles had a choice between a long life that would sink into oblivion or a short life and eternal glory. I will never achieve that. Why not? My father won't leave anything to me. Before I can prove myself, he'll have conquered all of Greece. Come here, I'll show you something. Come on. Let him have Greece. You've got the whole world left, from the Persian Empire all the way to India. Hundred years ago, their king attacked Greece. He destroyed our cities and burned the Acropolis of Athens. What happened then? The Greeks united and drove the Persians out. What is left for me then? The Persians are still a constant threat. Their soldiers are stationed across the Hellespont. They are right at our doorstep. Even Achilles' grave is in the hands of these barbarians. Do you want eternal glory? Unite the Greeks and lead them against the Persians. That would indeed be a heroic act. Aristotle was a polymath who knew his way around all topics. He was the son of a doctor. He taught Alexander medicine, science, and, of course, Homer. Alexander was hungry for knowledge. His education was important in his later life as an explorer and admirer of Homer. There is this famous quote of his, Philip gave me my life, but Aristotle gave me the good life. Aristotle's school was located in a remote nymph sanctuary, an ideal place to devote oneself to the search for wisdom and insight. Nature's got many secrets, but you will not be able to unlock them purely by thinking. You have to observe the world. You have to feel it, taste it, smell it, and discover it with your senses. Come on, try it. Huh. Observe it and understand it. Look, there's a feather. There's the nest. Hey, let's fetch an egg. We'll never get one. The bird will attack us. You scare him away, and I'll get the egg. That's far too dangerous. Achilles and Patroclus weren't afraid. Come on. Alexander's courage was proverbial. 
he took on every challenge. <laughs> and he had Hephaestion, his friend. He was always by his side. Alexander, the bird is coming back. Come down quickly. There's a fine line between courage and foolishness. Every venture has to be considered. Only then will it be rewarded. Remember that. The egg proves that I wasn't foolish, but courageous. Your words are wiser than your actions, Alexander. But if you just follow your passion, you act without sense. That's the end of the lesson. After three years, Alexander was ready for being a sovereign. Most of his preparation came from Aristotle. They didn't always agree, but the scholar remained one of his closest advisors. The best known legend from Alexander's childhood is the taming of Bucephalus. What's your father doing here? He's looking for horses for the royal guards. I can't wait for us to fight by the king's side. Maybe, but I don't think my father wants to have me by his side. What have you got today? A horse befitting only a king. This is Bucephalus, my best horse. But Bucephalus means ox head. Some think it's because of his branding. Others think it's because he is stubborn, like an ox. <laughs> A proud horse. What does it cost? Thirteen talents. That's a high price. Let me have a look at him. According to the sources, many tried, but nobody could ride the stallion. Only Alexander understood why the horse was in a panic. I know why Bucephalus is nervous. Why? Wait! I've got enough wild mares. I don't need a stubborn stallion. Father! I can ride him. Don't be too sure. If a grown man can't do it, why should you? Let me try it. Please. If I can't tame him, I'll pay you back. Okay, I'm offering six talents. <laughs> I don't want my son to be heavily indebted so young. Don't be afraid. You're afraid of your own shadow, right? Turn around. Calm down. Look at him. That's my son. <laughs> Look for a suitable kingdom, my son. Macedonia's too small for you. With this story, Alexander's conquests became providential, and his horse became the most famous animal of ancient times. The connection between the stallion and the prince was unique. No one but him was ever able to ride Bucephalus, they say. These stories are an attempt to explain something very special. They are told so that we can understand a special historical event or an outstanding historical figure. There is this young boy who seems to be a horse whisperer. He tames the horse using psychology so that the horse obeys on its own accord. This story essentially describes Alexander the Great's captivating charisma. 
However, Alexander's childhood ended abruptly when he was 16. The crown prince had to face a big task. King Philip's aggressive expansionism resulted in a new conflict. Bloody clashes were imminent. Philip went to war. In his absence, Alexander was supposed to rule the empire. I entrust my empire to your care. From now on, you are my co-regent. An attack at the Dardanelles caused the crisis. Philip captured a shipload of grain that was meant to go to Athens. The powerful state was furious and remembered an outrage from the distant past. When the Persians burned the temple of the city 150 years earlier, the Macedonians were allies of the Persians. The reconstruction of the temple was a symbol of Athens' triumph over the Persians. Eventually, they managed to fight off the enemy. At peak times, 80,000 people lived at the foot of the entrenched upper city. Athens has had a long history of democracy. The citizens decided on important matters. Sovereigns like those in Macedonia or Persia had long been abolished. Demosthenes was Philip's main adversary. With a passionate speech, the politician encouraged the council to put Macedonia into its place by military means. Not with words, but with deeds, our predecessors turned us into free Greeks with their blood. They saved us from Persian tyranny. But now, Athens' freedom is threatened again by Philip, king of Macedonia. But it was the Persians who destroyed our city back then, not the Macedonians. We should regard them as friends, not as a threat. We should form an alliance with them to destroy the Persians. The Macedonians are not Greeks, but barbarians. Like the Persians, they are full of malice. An alliance with them means having the enemy in our own home. The situation escalated into a war about Delphi. The temple wasn't only the Greeks' most sacred place, it played an important political role, too. Those who reigned Delphi held the power in the heartland. Athens guarded the sacred place, but other Greek cities also wanted to control Delphi. The Macedonians saved the sacred temple from the invasion. Athens felt humiliated when the barbarians were made custodians of Delphi. In all of Greece, they looked for allies who would fight against the hated King Philip. The battle took place near Charonea. This time, Alexander and his companions were also present. For most of them, it was their first big battle in the royal army. Only the best men fought alongside the Macedonian prince. Clytus, for instance, who was said to be experienced. Parmenion, an old general. He had a son, Philotus. He and Ptolemy were Alexander's childhood friends, just like his closest confidant, Hephaestion. The Macedonians knew that the victors of the Battle of Charonea in 338 BC would decide the future of the Aegean world. With 34,000 soldiers each, both armies were equally strong. Alexander led the cavalry. It was to be decisive. It was about glory and honor, life and death, all or nothing. 
Didn't you say your father wouldn't leave any glory to us? I was mistaken. Get ready! At my command! Alexander and his men faced a fierce challenge. The cavalry was supposed to lead the attack. Just like Achilles and Patroclus. Under Alexander's command, the cavalry defeated the Thebes, the dreaded elite troop. The Athenian foot soldiers were lured into a trap. They ran into a wall of deadly spears. The battle was won. Macedonia was the new military superpower in Greece. And Alexander was the hero of Charonea. Being the commander of the cavalry, it was Alexander who made victory possible. It strengthened his standing with the Macedonians, and, to a degree, also with the Greeks. It made him credible as a future king. After the battle, Philip summoned all the city's delegates to Corinth. Sparta refused but they still formed an alliance that forbade the Greeks to fight each other. Macedonia suggested attacking Persia together. Philip visited the Oracle of Delphi on his way back. The sovereign wants to know his chances against this mighty opponent. The royal inquiry to the god Apollo cost him a golden laurel wreath. The oracle spoke through a priestess. The Pythia went into a trance in order to enter the world and wisdom of the gods. That's what the ancient Greeks believed. Poor people would only get a short answer, yes or no. Rich men like Philip got exclusive prophecies. She says the bull is limited. He will come to an end for the one who makes a sacrifice. She talks about a sacrificial bull, a sign of the king's death. But which king is she referring to? The Persian king? Or Philip? As always, Pythia's prophecies were cryptic. The priests decided upon their interpretation. They held the true power in Delphi. You wanted to know whether you'd defeat the Persians. The oracle said, the king will die. Philip is in no doubt. The signs point to a victory. What's the matter? We'll fight the Persians. No, not us. Father has decided. Parmenian will go as an advance guard. Without us? Without us? Has he forgotten who won the Battle of Charonea? I think he fears that I'm better than him. You should worry less about Philip and more about his new wife. He's always had many women. Why would this one be different? Don't be stupid. Your father will let you down. Mother, please. His new bride is dearer to him than I could ever be. Not because of her beauty, but because she is a true Macedonian. If she gives the king a son, he will ascend the throne. On toast! 
Let us drink to the royal couple. To their health. May they provide us with a crown prince of pure Macedonian blood. See? What do you mean, huh? Alexander! He is drunk. Don't bother. I am the heir to the throne. Apologize, Alexander. Mathalos is my guest. I apologize. If you pay me the necessary respect, I'm still the king. I'm still the king. And it's still me who decides. And you have to obey me. Obey. Obey you? Look at you. You want to fight the Persians? You can't even walk straight, you fools. Together, you united Greece in battle, and now you argue amongst yourselves. Come on. We're not welcome anymore. Just leave. I don't want to ever see you again. Alexander and his mother went into exile to Epirus, Olympia's home. Endless months passed without any contact between father and son. Alexander was shunned. But as he was needed for the war against Persia, the Macedonian court eventually sent for him. You called for me, mother? Alexander. My old friend. <laughs> <laughs> Demaratus was sent by your father, who wants to reconcile with you. Did he say so? You know him. An apology is even harder for him than praise. But he regrets your dispute, and it is his most fervent wish that his son return to him. Hollow words. Hasn't Philip humiliated you enough? Instead of kneeling before him, you should take what is rightfully yours, with a sword in your hand. But he's my father. Zeus is your father. Please leave us alone. Mother. I've learned to tell courage from foolishness. The Macedonian nobility is on his side. Then earn their support. Look at you, my son. You are everything that Philip isn't. He is coarse, and you are noble. He is a warrior, but you... You are a king. Stop it. I won't fight my own father. He is not your father. It is not his blood that runs through your veins. We don't owe him anything. Olympias and Alexander have got common interests. Olympias can only influence the situation via her son. Her life could possibly depend on her son staying in power. Almost another year passed without further events. It was a wedding between the Macedonian royal dynasty and Olympias' family that marked a turning point. The dispute caused a stir in Pella. Upon Philip's invitation, Alexander finally returned. The men demonstrated their unity in the best interests of their kingdom. King Philip didn't suspect an assassin among his guests. Behold, father and son reunited. Father and son were reunited. But not everyone seemed to approve of the reconciliation. Uh, 
father. The king was killed by his own bodyguard. Father! Someone help him! But it was too late for the sovereign. He died at the age of 46. King Philip is dead. Long live King Alexander. The way to the throne was open. Alexander took over without hesitation. Long live King Alexander. Long live King Alexander. Alexander and his mother were suspected of being instigators. Both had a motive, especially Olympias. She felt humiliated by Philip's new wife, and she desperately wanted Alexander to be king. Philip's murder was never solved. If Olympias had given the impression of wanting to keep her place at court and support her son Alexander, then such accusations were bound to be made. The next logical step for such a woman was to be unfaithful, or to poison her husband, or instigate murder. Alexander buried his father in Virgina, according to Macedonian customs. The burial chamber is under a hill. Whether it really is, King Philip's tomb is unclear to this day. The precious grave furnishings do suggest it. The crown, made of oak motifs, is made from pure gold. The larnax is also made of gold. The lid is decorated with the Virgina sun. The 16-rayed solar symbol is the emblem of Alexander's father, Philip. His legacy was a difficult one for the new king of Macedonia. Old opponents reappeared. Like his father, Alexander had to assert his sovereignty. If necessary, by force, Alexander began from zero. The Athenians used the change in power to question Macedonia's leading role. Again, Demosthenes was the spokesman. The gods have heard our prayers. They punished that tyrant Philip with his death. We have to act now. It's time to rebel against Alexander and take vengeance for Charonea. For the freedom of Athens, take up arms. The tribes in the north rebelled first, followed by the big city-states led by Athens and Thebes. No one wanted to miss out in the struggle for power, but the battle still had to be fought. Alexander quickly moved from the battlefields in the north to Thebes, but he tried to be diplomatic first. He promised to spare them if they surrendered. And? The Thebans won't give in. They'd rather fight for their freedom than surrender to a tyrant. <sighs> Some even believe you were killed in battle. Then a dead man will teach them fear. Alexander acted like a cold power politician. Without hesitation, he made an example of Thebes. His troops conquered the city and flattened it. More than 6,000 people died. Neither friend nor foe was to be left in any doubt. Alexander was determined to assert his leading role. 
the survivors of the massacre were all made slaves. The measures were approved by the League of Corinth. He justified it with the claim that thieves broke the pact. The destruction of Thebes was a clear signal to all cities in Greece that opposed the supremacy of Macedonia. Embodied by the king of Macedonia, the commander of the League of Corinth. The citizens of Athens wrote to Alexander, king of Macedonia, the new hegemon of the League of Corinth. We praise you and congratulate you on the punishment of Thebes. We renew our oath to your father. We will stand by you as you are the defender of freedom always. Resistance was overcome and peace was secured. Now, it was time for Alexander to focus on foreign affairs. The coast beyond the Dardanelles, in today's Turkey, was his next destination in his campaign against Greece's archenemy. Alexander prepared for battle against the King of Kings, the sovereign of the Persian Empire. The most powerful empire in the world at the time reached across three continents and featured insurmountable mountain ranges. It touched the Indian borders. Even Babylon, the prettiest city of the East, was conquered by the Persians and made their second capital. Their army was 300,000 men strong and caused fear and terror everywhere. King Darius was a mighty, powerful enemy. Fighting a war against him would be a battle between David and Goliath. But the Macedonian didn't know fear. Alexander was determined to imitate Achilles. Just like the mythical hero, he wanted to take revenge and bring victory to Greece. In the spring of 334 BC, one of the biggest invasions in history began. Alexander risked everything. 